I think we will see those echoes of the past in the days to come. Right now, rather than dwell about how the court progressed from that situation, from uh, being a laser fair court and saying that it is, it is the executive which will dictate policy. It is the executive which will have primacy over how uh, the administration has to be run. And that the role of the court is fairly minimal in this context is how the Supreme Court failed us in the period of the emergency. Post-emergency, the court had to reinvent itself in order to regain some of its uh, credibility. Um, and I think it's very important to understand. So I think going back to my pet peeve and my pet theme, that post-emergency, the court had to reinvent itself in order to gain credibility, and they did. And largely the work of the pioneers in that being Justice Krishna Ayer, Justice Chinnaparedi, who reinvented the entire access to justice itself. So what did PIL really mean? I mean, you know, many authors prefer to use the term social action litigation rather than public interest litigation for whatever reasons it is. I mean, though PIL has come to stay, if you ask me, social action litigation didn't catch on the way it ought to have. So Justice, though Professor Upendra Bhaksi did pitch till now, until 2020, he keeps talking about how social action litigation is a preferred term to, to an ambiguous and amorphous public interest litigation. Nevertheless, PIL or SAL, depending on whatever you want to call it, has been come to stay. And largely it was because post-emergency, when the Supreme Court reinvented itself, it did two things in terms of access to justice. It did away with the formalistic theory that you must file a proper petition in a proper manner and you know if you go to the Bombay bar the, the drafting says most humbly sure in a language that nobody ever even employs anymore so therefore the the employment of uh, archaic English with Latin thrown into boot was the large measure of how people were accessing the courts till then Post-emergency, the court said, no, we don't need this formalistic mode of approaching court. You can come to court based on even a, you know, a letter on a postcard even. So a postcard, in theory, became a manner in which people could access courts. And a postcard could be how you would move court. And who could move courts by a postcard? Did it have to be the person aggrieved? Supreme Court further said that we will relax the rule of locus general. The traditional rule of locus is that only a person aggrieved can come to court. And therefore, that is how suits were determined. That is how writ petitions were entertained. But now the courts said that's no longer the manner in which we will approach how people can access the court system. Anybody, any citizen of India, could approach the court and file a, a petition by way of a letter. They could send a postcard to court and we will, the court can be moved by any person. And in the early years of PIL, after you relax the rule of locus standard, after you relax the formalistic mode of how you could approach the court, the next step was the courts would often be confronted with issues on which they had no expertise, issues on which there would often be you know, a conflict on facts, disputed questions of fact, as you, if you would want to call it that. And therefore, the courts would have to retreat from the traditional mode of saying that under 226, which is what people went post-emergency, approaching the high courts under 226 and the Supreme Court of India under 32, and very often, the state or whoever the respondent was was actually saying, will you switch on the slide, I think. You want the slide to be open now? Our slide is open because I can't yes, see sir. it. Just a minute, sir. Just a minute.
So in the, can you see the slide? No problem. So I can't see the slide on my screen. Just so a minute, just, just a minute. So therefore the court in the early years was using what is called relegating people saying that's not something we can do anything about because there is a conflict between what you're saying and what the respondent is saying. So there is no adjudication possible. Just a minute, sir, you proceed on. I think there is some difference. Am I online? No, you are no. online, sir. But your oh, photo is not visible. So the next was being a post box approach, merely asking the respondent to come up, you know, respond to the allegations of the complaint and dispose of the grievance of the petition. A typical mandamus to dispose of representation, if you will, was the next approach. But this didn't work because clearly people were coming to court after sending a representation and after that representation not uh, you know yielding any positive response and to send them back to the very person who did not deal with the grievance was really taking them nowhere so therefore the next stage of keeping the matter pending and asking the respondent to come up with a report so that the court could hear the petitioner and the court could review the report was the next step the, the fourth step was in this continuing mandamus. Very often, the court was confronted with the fact that this adjudication was not possible uh, entirely, uh, you know, fruitfully because there were technical issues. The very nature of the adjudication involved the involvement of experts. The courts felt handicapped because they were not experts in the subject matter. And the lawyers who were approaching the court on behalf of, of the agreed party were not necessarily the expert. Or it was a letter petition, it was a postcard. So where you couldn't. So this again was what I spoke to you earlier. Post emergency of the realization by the court that it needed to be reinvent itself or it would run the risk of continuing to be irrelevant to the vast masses of people and even lose the faith of the lawyers who were an important part of the system. And this was made possible by what I said earlier. As we speak, the courts found that yes, a continuing mandamus without the input of a properly equipped participant or a stakeholder was not carrying the adjudication very far. So they resorted to the strategy of appointing experts, either as committees, or expert lawyers as amaikai in order to ensure that they had proper assistance. Because if you had a letter petition, obviously you had no one to fall back on. If you had necessarily at that point, the court was also falling back on the legal aid uh, panel lawyers. But given the poor infrastructure availability and the, in, uh, the resources available, this obviously was not something that is satisfactory. And the court was often tested by the executive saying that no, this is a matter of policy. This is a matter where I have complete suzerainty of the subject matter. This is not a matter which is suitable for judicial adjudication. Therefore, the court had to overcome this resistance. And you're seeing this now, even now, all this is this emergency era and the immediate post emergency era issues of what we are continuing to see with the court system as we speak with the attorney general and the solicitor general telling the courts, please stop these PIL shops. Please do not interfere. We know what we are doing. We are doing what we can. You, neither you, the court, nor the petitioners are competent to determine whether our actions in these times are correct or not. Let us do our job. And that would suffice. So the court had to perforce tell the respondent, no, this is not an adversarial matter. We are all trying to see how the situation can be further improved. And in this spirit of participation, where neither the petitioner nor the court 
are trying to find fault with the executive, but we are telling you, uh, uh, is there not a better way to do things? Is this not something that you look at? So this soft approach to telling the executive that this is a non-adversarial approach was an entry point into what was largely, you know, the constitutional policy making. Earlier, we, we were told that, you know, the separation of powers. Can I see the next slide, please? The separation of powers meant that the parliament would make policies, would legislative policy by way of, you know, making these, uh, the statute. The executive would have to give effect to these by way of implementing this legislative policy by subordinate legislation and by ensuring executive action to fall in line with the legislative policy. But clearly that wasn't how the cookie was crumbling or how things were working. So therefore, the court in the guise, in the, in the entry point of saying this is non adversarial nature, largely intervened in human rights, labor law, and today you know, we are seeing that labor laws are being diluted. This is a matter of grave concern. We have seen estimates between 4 crore to 10 crore guest laborers, called otherwise crudely called migrant labor, who have worked, who have given their sweat and toil to various states whose rights are going to be taken away. That is a situation which is likely to end up in challenge in courts. And this is exactly what in the early days of PIL, when we had the Asia villages being built, the constructive phase, the India was telling the rest of the world that we are building world-class sports facilities and we are going to implement it. And we can't brook interference in this. Do not tell us how to do it because we have to tell the world what a great nation we are. Nothing has changed really. We are still, you know, pumping our chest and telling ourselves that we are a great nation. We certainly are. There are no two doubts about it. But however great a nation we are in terms of our history, in terms of the developments that have happened, in terms of you know, sending Chandrayaan into space, nothing has changed for most of our population. Most of our population continues to languish in subhuman condition. Supreme Court had to reinvent in terms of human rights law, saying that Article 21 is how we will enter. Article 21 is not a mere right to life. So the, the Supreme Court will approach with people telling them that under the guise of the Asia village, putting up world-class facilities, the workers there were being treated poorly. And that is how the Supreme Court interfered in the various, in the Bandhu Mukti Mochas, looking at bonded labor, looking at the plight of the working class across the country. Because whatever you may send people into space, into orbit, into moon expeditions, you can't lose sight of the fact that it is the poor of this country who are the powerhouse of our great nation. And if you neglect that powerhouse, if you alienate them from your achievement, you run the risk of having them taken to arms, of ensuring that whatever development that you have, that you are so proud of, is undone. And to run the risk of that is what Justice Krishna would say, if you do not do this, if you don't bring their grievance into your radar, they will find other ways and means of ensuring that their grievances are going to be heard. And that does not bode well for anyone. I paraphrase him certainly. But this was one concern of PIL. Saying, all right, you've done away with the emergency. But it's not a magic wand that another government has come to power. And therefore, all is well. And therefore, these are the various issues. Labor was something that had to be looked at. Human rights. People in prison. I and, mean, you know, people... Luckily, most of our political class, you know, after emergency, the mid 70s is where all of them went back into jail. So therefore, they had some real concern over the conditions of jail. And some part of the political class found its way into 
the judiciary. I mean, after all, Justice Krishna was a minister, was a politician. He came into it and he realized that if you needed to look at human rights, you can't ignore jails. And that's how the whole Sunil Batra cases, the whole entire Ruzenara Katun cases, how people looked at the fact every day in and day out, the subordinate judiciary, I, heard, I, I hate to use that word because it implies that in the hierarchy, there is a hierarchy of courts where the subordinate courts are subordinate to the uh, supreme judiciary. I mean, the, the, the first responder to the human rights violation is the remand judge. And if they don't look at these issues, and we saw that the Supreme Court had to intervene in the whole Sunil Batra cases and the Hussein Ara Khartoum cases, in spite of the fact that we had a functioning um, committee for the implementation of legal aid schemes, SILAS. We had legal aid boards functioning across the country. We had the subordinate judiciary, I use that word again advisedly, um, you know, looking at become uh, you know, inured to seeing people being brought in chains, in handcuffs. And the court said, we will not permit you to do this. If you want to bring people to court in chains, you need to get the order of the magistrate. And therefore, an entire jurisprudence of prison jurisprudence, of under trial jurisprudence, came to how the judiciary intervened in the whole task of uh, you know, adjudication of the rights of under trials and people who did not have otherwise access to courts because they had access, the only person, the only judge they saw was the under trial judge. More often than not, in the under trial, the judge did not have access to resources. It was had very poor infrastructure. You know, it's like talking blood to the butcher. Here, the she, I will use that term, didn't had to deal with so many cases with very little secretarial infrastructure. So therefore, uh, the Supreme Court had to inject sensitivity into the system top down. And that's how that happened. In, and one way the Supreme Court felt that poss possibly the reason why courts are not participated enough in this task of ensuring that the promises of the preamble, justice, economic, and political, reach the vast masses of the people, which is what Antyodhya Dharma, which is the, bot the bottom line, the underlying substrate of the preamble and the constitution. Antyodhya Dharma means justice to the last man in the queue. So that dharma, if it had to happen, was not happening perhaps because of a certain resistance in the judiciary. And probably that resistance in the judiciary came because the judiciary came from a certain background. And the judiciary came from a certain background because of the nature of the beast, because how judges were chosen and how they were kept in office. And, how, and if you were too participative, there was a weapon of transfer. How to insulate the judges and how to ensure that judges are drawn from all sorts of strata of society. This can only happen if there's a collegiality in the, in the uh, how the judges were chosen and how they were treated. So this corporatization of the judiciary happened as a result of public interest litigation, happened as a result of the uh, ju uh, Supreme Court advocates in records case happened the courts in uh, judges one, judges two ensured in PIL that judges were chosen largely by a judge driven process that is a collegium of judges who would, cho who would choose judges who would have primacy in the choice of judges yes the executive would participate the last word would be that of judges and how they would be transferred and how the judiciary had to be consulted in these modes and manners of their office. An environment became center stage in this whole process because ultimately when you talk about human rights, you are talking about the most basic human rights, all conflicts, the uh, human rights deprivations occur because the state uses illegitimate force both the state and the non-state players in order to ensure 
people are deprived of resources and people who have you know who are sitting on resources are displaced and these resources are then distributed in a non transparent fashion to subserve corporate interests so therefore the environment was recognized as being the most basic of the human rights though it, it comes in a you know third generation human rights and this collective rights further down so therefore courts recognized the fact that you had to ensure that environmental rights were had to, were to be safeguarded and in the safeguard of human rights was apart from this entire widening of the rule of locus standi and an ensuring access to courts was given to all and sundry was where the great revolution in how we moved away from a traditional and conventional common law system what does a common law system tell you that a plaintiff has to prove his or her case that's a fundamental rule of common law but who would come and complain of environmental deprivation it was a poor villager and to expect the villager to marshal signs in support of their contention that there could be pollution on account of a prospective activity or that there is actual pollution on account of a particular activity to was to expect the moon I mean, today of course courts have recognized that even scientific evidence being marshaled in support of of uh, issues has its own limitations and therefore epidemiology requires actually a narrative from the affected person and you can't rely only on scientists that the victim has to be heard in ensuring that even science would be properly sensitized sensitized by Uh, you know this narrative and it's not traditional science but therefore environment meant environmental law and environmental adjudication meant that the traditional onus of proof was shifted from the plaintiff to the respondent who was altering the status quo who was running the industry who had to prove that the operations of their industry or the activity that they were ஒரு <laughs> keep more time for discussion just so now i, I sent a message I, to our I, participants to raise the question by option choice so they'll okay. be doing it sir no problem no okay. yeah. i i'll keep the chat on so i know when people have questions there is an option that raise the yeah. hands i, I just raise... that's why i put the chat up so i've seen the option for raise the hands yes sir yes sir problem. i hope i see the raise the hands so the traditional rule of the onus of proof the onus of proof being on the plaintiff was shifted away the issues of the you know we are a conservative court our tort law has hardly developed and that's the reason why our tort law has not properly developed is i think that we have neglected the trial court in this mad rush to take everything to the supreme court or to the high court and the mad rush has happened because the the fashionistas of pil as we all are have all practiced in the high court and the supreme court and we don't want to get our hands dirty by going to the trial court which is where actually all the action should happen now that the supreme court has just moved away from setting up this you know issue as i told earlier told you earlier that uh, you know they moved from a post box approach to a continuing mandamus approach to a situation where they would set up scientific committees and appoint amica to in to do this matters but this is as you know not systemic change this was still you know bandaged jurisprudence if you will have it court was looking at a problem looking at solving the problem through the mode of appointing a committee and telling the executive nudging the executive we are in a non adversarial system 
here is a committee which has come up with a, some suggestions. Here are amicre who have been appointed by us. There have been more than one in the case. If you look at the forest case, how many years it has gone on and how many reports have come. There is a centrally empowered committee and there is an amicus. So the central empowered committee gives reports. The amicus, the amicus responds. So you have this legal input coming from the amicus and there is a techno legal input coming from the central empowered committee which is assisting the court. So this amalgam of moving away from just having an expert put into the box and being cross-examined in our traditional jurisprudence, this is the what we have tried. But the next stage that the Supreme Court did was to actually look at jurisprudence of in various issues. I looked at human rights, for example, moving away from the traditional, looking at fundamental rights as it being cocoon, and part three being looked at separately and not being you know directive principles of state policy not being part of this whole imagery the international law being something that we read in uh, especially international human rights law being something that we read in law school law college and forgotten all about therefore the court in this new avatar post emergency evolved the jurisprudence looking at best practices from different countries looking at how public international law has evolved on human rights and looking at how to read that into Article 21. And that's what the courts did. So, therefore, in public interest law, whether it was in human rights, whether it was an environment, whether it was in public accountability, which you see on the screen there, good governance was also now said to be part of Article 21. How courts would look at environment, look at adjudication on human rights, was ensuring good governance and good practices from abroad being looked at as part of policy making through PILs in general. And that's how evolving jurisprudence was an important part of how the courts dealt with. And the next issue was yes, we've appointed, you know, we've appointed Amica, we've set out jurisprudence, principles, and if you look at environment law, principles which we brought in were. Polluter would pay, not that you pollute, you pay and then pollute, but saying no, we can't externalize the cost of pollution. And in an industry can't simply pollute and then say offer some minor compensation. You and then the the taxpayer and the poor of this country would bear the burden of reversing the damage caused to the environment. The Supreme Court said no, the polluter would have to pay. And that polluter would have to, there's no more that the, the taxpayer would have to do. This polluter would have to be in terms of the absolute liability principle. Now, strangely, the NGT a few years, few days ago, took cognizance of the gas leak, the styrene, they say, gas leak in Vaisal, and said the strict liability principle would apply. Unfortunately for the, uh, for, uh, the NGT, and fortunately for us, we moved away from the strict liability principle in 1985 in the oleum gas leak case. And they said strict liability has some exceptions, act of God, act of stranger. The absolute liability principle meant that there are, there are no, there are no uh, escape walls for the industry. If you do a dangerous process and if the, there is an intervening act, nevertheless, as someone who brought this into this dangerous process or the substance into the environment and stored it or manufactured it, you would be responsible for this. So therefore, the courts looked at this new evolving principle as part of the entire polluter would pay, no longer would they be able to externalize. The courts also said that uh, you know, apart from this, these principles, intergenerational equity were very important. And that's really something that, you know, today policy makers are looking at, you know, coal or iron ore as something that's, you know, something that you can distribute. The policy maker looks at the environment in terms of, uh, and resources in terms of pure, pure numbers, okay? You have X number, X amount of uh, resource, you have Y amount of uh, people who are willing to buy it, 
what is it that they want to do water as a resource but there is something that you need to bear in mind that you can't exhaust all these resources at one shot you need to preserve them for the future generations and therefore the intergenerational equity was a principle and today there is also a principle something called a principle of non regression the principle of non regression is and something that you see now today environmental law is rapidly being diluted because the present policy makers and the law makers believe that environmental laws are a stumbling block to development and especially in the post covid situation you are going to see a situation where environmental legislation is going to be diluted and uh, labor laws are already being diluted in up and madhya pradesh they are already being diluted you are seeing what uh, you know a small microcosm of what is lying beyond we are going to see the monster rear its head and poor people who are already bearing the brunt of dying by exposure to pollutants in vizag are going to see their rights being even more taken away so therefore the you know this whole principle would require a sensitive adjudicator and you know that's something that the next issue who came when the supreme court said we have established a jurisprudence but how is this who is going to enforce all these wonderful principles that we have exposed so the, you know you know the next thing that they said is we will look at these institutions which have come up in mv naidu they looked at the various tribunalization because governments love tribunals they hate courts let's bear that in mind that courts are very often unpredictable you don't have control over them because thanks to you know this whole collegium system which everybody loves to punch every once in a while you now have people coming into the system who may not be so respectful of the dominant discourse of the day so they are going to say no there is another point of view and why don't we look at that and therefore these loose canons for the uh, executive in the higher judiciary meant that they had to find a way to take the adjudication away from this you know higher judiciary and take it somewhere where they could control this adjudication so tribunals are the best bet as to how you can take away this this unpredictability and how do you do it a mix a mix of administrative scientific and you know uh, judicial so you know the judi once you have this mix coming in the judicial participation becomes a minority so what did courts do court then said we will now look at how these tribunals are being run we will look at how these institutions have to be set up and if need be we will set up our own institutional framework to implement the law so apart from the entire appointment of amicus appointment of committees with a regulatory nature courts looked at the existing legislative framework such as the environment protection act where the central government can set up you know bodies to pass binding orders on compensation on ensuring that the en environment is protected and the court in very many places said we will appoint uh, you know an authority under the environment protection act when it came to pollution in vellore for example you know one of the most polluted places on the planet at that time and the court said we will appoint or we will ensure that a loss of ecology authority is appointed and that authority will ensure that victims of pollution are identified using the polluter based principle and after identification the polluter based principle is uh, is here is imposed bearing in mind the principle of the you know onus of proof being reversed the industry has to prove they are not responsible and even if there is scientific uncertainty that science which tells you that the industry is wrong or that the industry is polluting should be preferred there's another principle to be bear in mind when you talk about the precautionary principle is a major part is a part of the polluter pays corollary to the polluter pays principle so therefore this entire issues on setting up an institution when it came to the velour case when it came to protecting the, uh, the that happened in 1995 soon thereafter in the, the era of kuldeep singh soon thereafter came the uh, you know protecting the coastal areas 
there was a from 91 we had a coastal zone mode protection notification and that notification was almost a dead letter till the supreme court infused life into it called for reports in a continuing mandamus from every state government on how they prepared you know this is all task for the executive but since the executive didn't do anything for several years they set it up they ensured that coastal zone management plans were prepared and approved by the ministry of environment and forest and they said no we will also ensure that the ministry you know, and the state governments set up a central at the by ministry sets up at the central level a national coastal zone management authority and state government set up at the state level state coastal zone management authorities to protect the environment and ensure projects receive due diligence before they are permitted to be set up in the first instance so this is how is my video on or is that so this is how the institutional framework became a reality and in the entire r gandhi case and the madras bar association case supreme court has been looking at how members to the tribunal have been appointed though the ministry still likes to cook us you know cook us new cuts all these various orders and continuing to ensure that somehow they managed to have their writ run it's a, it's you know a battle of who will blink first and the supreme court has proved itself up to the task so far of ensuring that there is the in the appointment of members to the tribunal there will continue to be an involvement of the judiciary to ensure that the members of the tribunal are insulated from the pressures and pulls of and you know they are appointing authority so but nevertheless in especially in the uh, post covid world and i think everyone has is you know is keen to uh, i feel quite uh, sometimes um, skeptical about you know we've dealt with i've been in pils for the last 30 years and at every stage losing a case has never made me upset about my faith in the judiciary um because i think that's you know even when we read the 80s and the 90s the heady days it was not as if every judgment was pro pi there were a few strong judges who continued to voice their opinions you know unmindful of the criticism that they got from the dominant discourse of the day and you know it is ultimately public opinion that ensured that this jurisprudence evolved by them became part of you know folklore and continued to be you know something that you look up to and you continue to cite them in courts you know in the uh, post 90s phase uh, there was a backlash if you take the uh, rona case where justice sujata manohar was dealing with uh, someone who went to court challenging a tender he was a rival tender and uh, maharashtra state electricity board had issued it and there was an interim order by court and found its way to the supreme court the court said anybody seeking an interim order against any public project should therefore you know uh, give security only then should courts grant interim orders against projects this is a roll back in the sense in balco supreme court did say a whole lot of things which sounded you know a voice of caution to judges across the country but it is you know in a sense a, a, a tribute to the robust nature of uh, how judges have been selected that many judges continued to plod on and continued to uh, provide some light to the poor of this country but those were in good times these are covid times these are times when courts are telling litigants do not come here we don't want to disrupt these are hard times you know this is ap shah wrote a scintillating article where he quotes cesaro uh, where he says when the drums of war sound you know the voice of the of judges goes silent and he says that shouldn't be how it is but certainly you know we are not used we are not unused to the executive trying to browbeat either uh, you know the entire legal system Activists, lawyers who have gone to court 
have not done it for publicity they have not done it for plaudits though you know the supreme court has often been talking about publicity interest litigation pejoratively referring to it but if you look at the vast masses of pil who have come and social action litigation they certainly have been they have been for the plight of the working classes they have been for the plight of the migrant labor they have been by lawyers who are you know to use thomas gray's uh, words uncoffined unknown and unknown nobody knows them these are lawyers who have not on uh, tv channels i don't know why these you know publicity interest uh, skepticism is reserved only for uh, for such lawyers vast masses of corporate lawyers you can find them soliciting on the martindale hubbard find them in pink pages writing columns you find them on tv shows uh, waxing eloquent but to them is not this uh, pejorative but for the vast masses of public interest lawyers who seek to make yes politics out of adjudication because let's not fool ourselves constitution is about politics adjudication is about politics it is about whether the politics of the dominant discourse would govern us or whether the judiciary would ensure that the voice of the unreached reaches the court reaches jurisprudence and reaches our entire policy making exercises and ensure ensuring that the poor of this country are the center stage of how uh, adjudication is done the small man i you know i was reading uh, you know people talk often talk about the man in the clapham omnibus uh, we have to talk about i wrote in 1975 uh, the you know, the advocate general welcomed the chief justice is saying the man in the number one bus from uh, ice house to from triplicate to the high court so we have to make sure that the man in the number one bus is the center point of all this entire court system and the constitutional adjudication and i think central to that is to ensure that we don't allow this uh, you know public interest law to be hijacked by lawyers in the high court and the supreme court of india people often believe because of where it started that uh, you know there is the only pil mean 226 when i give lectures to to you know sometimes judges on uh, sub uh, civil judges on constitution and civil law there is a little amount of skepticism as to saying why are we being told this of what relevance and our immediate need is when i talk about environment in the post ngt phase people you know still judges ask me it's no longer the province of the civil court why are we being told all this but there is enough in the cpc and the crpc which has always been in our statute book nothing new we just haven't used them in fact krishna gives plaudits to the executive magistrate in the ratlam municipality case for breathing life into 133 of the crpc and issuing orders to ensure that sewage is properly disposed of and garbage is properly disposed of and he says this is how our crpc should be used and today on human rights I mean much uh, more than hcps it is a remand magistrate who is looking you know the, the sentinel key weave as he as he were as she is and looking at the uh, under trial brought before her and saying have you been ill treated when is it that you were taken into custody let me look at the remand report what is the need for a remand and you know they we are seeing younger judges being fairly activist in this and it's very heartening to see that we are seeing at that level of the trial court a lot more activism maybe that's how enough of the top down approach maybe it's time there is enough law laid down let us now challenge the uh, the higher judiciary by going back to the trial court and by by ensuring the trial judges who are still are stressed for time who have limited infrastructure is is much better than how it was in the 70s but it is also ensuring that our colleagues actors at that uh, at the who practicing in the trial court are pushing the envelope and ensuring that the uh, trial court judges use every provision of the crpc to protect the rights of the under trial after all the supreme court has told us that dd basu has to be adhered 
there's a list of commandments as to what the uh, while arrest what should be done every uh, you know uh, trial trial lawyer and everyone in the uh, legal aid panel has now been been deemed into them the panel lawyers panel b lawyers who are five years and above uh, have constantly been told this when they are they are constantly asked to go to the police stations and ask the under trials whether there has been compliance and remand magistrates are asking these questions but to keep this continue to keep this center stage is the challenge uh, i have no doubt that if we ensure that we go back to the trial court and our colleagues in the trial court continue to play an activist role we will not read much of uh, you know activism in the superior courts and you know even in the civil court it's not as if so you know 226 is the be all and end all order one rule eight was there the suits in a representative capacity could be filed but at least the person who the plaintiff had to be personally agree section 91 of the code of the civil procedure code dealing with uh, you know section a uh, new nuisance was also something that has been used in the past has to be you know more used in in the future but there is something that prevents people from going to the trial courts whether we like it or not trial courts are over not to say that superior courts have a you know cushy time all judges across the court with the poor judges to population ratio and judges to litigation ratio are hard pressed for time i mean nobody takes that away from them and it's sometimes you know a wondrous thing that you know in among all this dust and din of their everyday life they are able to find the time and the involvement and empathy to look down and see some issue and decide to participate in you know get hands full, full on and ensure that they will change the change life as we know you know the, the very act of judicial observation changes reality and that's what the american realists tell us and clearly every issue that the courts look at in some manner alters it and if they haven't it's because many orders have remained on paper because lawyers who should have gone back to the field and ensured that these orders are implemented have not been up to the task and there's a, there's a challenge is there is declining involvement in public interest law and there's something that we have to face up if today everybody is quite happy to read the newspaper and file a case based on a newspaper article now i hate to be ageist but in in those days you had to go back to the field you had to collect you no know, information you had to give names of people who were witnesses to the violations you would collect affidavits from them you would come back after this hard days or hard weeks work come back with what my boss would call a brandeis brief you prepare a case which would have a multidisciplinary approach a newspaper article was never the basis you would have to find empirical data to back you up you would need to file you need to find witness statements to back you up your narrative would have to be a story which would bring judges you know several times they were hostile they thought pil lawyers were you know publicity hungry hungry they thought pil lawyers didn't have any work and they would they thought that pil lawyers you know were not particularly successful lawyers may well be true but therefore this was the early hostility today things are a lot better judges are more receptive to this up to a point they don't have the bandwidth to handle it beyond it and uh, you know it's not a shoot scoot shoot and scoot scenario so unless lawyers are committed to a long term involvement very often clients disappear from the scene i mean come on if your pil takes 12 years to come to final adjudication which litigant do you expect however public interest that litigation uh, oriented that litigant litigant is do you expect them to have that that horizon of interest and but whether you like it or not having filed a vakalat in that matter and having stood up in court you have a commitment to the brief as long as that brief is alive 
and you've got to go back and convince the court that your brief is sincere, that you are someone who has an enduring interest in this. And unless we are able to do this, and I see a lot of youngsters who are very good at their task. I mean, today with the internet, research is no longer as difficult as it is was. You don't have to go to difficult, you know, inaccessible libraries, schedule people to give you access, run through dusty volumes of scientific, uh, you know, information, try and wade through all of that yourself. But today things are a lot easier. But things are not that easy that you can do away with, you know, getting your hands dirty. You still have to go beyond what you can find on the internet. Even case law research, much of the judgments that we rely on are the early years. Much of it I don't find even on your Indian Kanun. It's very difficult to access these. In the, I don't know why. But still this fallback is something that you still have to go back to your, you know, brick and mortar stuff. And therefore, the challenges exist. In the post-COVID world, these challenges are going to be greater. I think there's no point wanting to rush to the Supreme Court. They are too few. And I think our high courts are more relevant. Our uh, trial courts are more relevant to our everyday lives. Let's not think that, you know, the sun shines out of Delhi's backside. The sun shines everywhere. Let's go back to our roots. Let's go back to our trial courts. Let's invest more confidence in our high courts and our uh, um, trial courts. And they, I'm sure they are more than equal to the task of ensuring something. What the Supreme Court said in the 80s and 90s, to make that a reality, I think it's about time we went back to the basics. So it's very important uh, not to be trigger happy and go to court. Because I think a lot of these people, you see that in the Supreme Court all the time. Uh, you know, now courts are saying, I mean, there's more than one view on this. But if you go to court with a poorly prepared uh, petition, or you, you know, you don't think it through, and you bring it up before not someone who's not particularly inclined, and you end up having an adjudication, then you cure the pitch for the others. And very often than not, once the court adjudicates it, especially in the Supreme Court, even a protest or a movement is constantly told, the oracle is spoken, Supreme Court has decided, there is no question. Democracy stops and ends with the Supreme Court. No, it doesn't. I'm, so, I'm sorry. You can continue to raise something in the domain which the courts have refused to interfere, whether it's the Rafal deal or something, that is, or the issue of migrants. For heaven's sake, we do not have to worry, and heaven doesn't exist. So we, for, we do not have to be worried about what Supreme Court judges believe is right or wrong. The ultimate arbiter of you know, right and wrong in a democracy is the vox populi, the voice of the people. So we will continue to raise this and hopefully constantly asking these questions. We'll make sure we have better adjudicators, we have better uh, you know, people in government and you know, governance on the whole is better is improved. Uh, then I said the conflict of interest, very often they're not, you know, you, know, you see people who are involved with the case in some manner or other, you know, especially lawyers filing cases, is, you know, is, is a very dangerous thing. It, it, I see there is, a, there is a value to it. I see that in many matters, uh, you know, lawyers know some issues like, you know, the rights of under trials and the conditions in jails, better than, you know, human rights activists sometimes. Uh, but my worry is that sometimes you're the lawyer who appeared in the matter and you, you don't properly think it through and more often than not the other side is going to bring up the conflict of interest and you're going to do the, that as a disservice. Next slide please. This perennial thing that you know as even in the heydays of PIL there were most judges who were saying these are matters of policy. So you're going to some judges are going to say that more than the others in these days. So, but let's face it, some issues are best left for you to lobby and for you to ensure that your representatives, your elected representatives are, you know, more, more responsive to the mood of the times. On some, if they are amenable to the justiciability, ensure that you pitch that law versus policy debate in a proper fashion 
so that international law, best practice, constitutional policy are all you know, implicit in the provisions of law or are read into the provision that you want to marshal in your support. Yes, yes, there is publicity. Yes, I mean, very often they're not. I think that sometimes KILs are set up by industry to get a quick dismissal so that people who come later are confronted with the order and courts say, sorry, we dismissed your uh, previous PIL. Now go all the way up to the Supreme Court because PILs in the High Court, in the 226 petitions, are forced to go for division bench with most, uh, in almost all High Courts. And next talk, the first, talk, first adjudication is by a division bench. And before you know it, you have to go to the Supreme Court and we all know what happens on SLP day. And ultimately, the entire issue of if you have an overreach on what you're asking the court, and the court passes even what you want, and if you don't have the bandwidth, if you don't have the infrastructure, if you don't have the commitment to ensure that you see the order. In the, I remember in the 80s, orders, you know, when orders were passed on halting projects, the orders were passed, but you know, the litigants were scared to enforce the order and because of whatever reason, one of them had been abducted by uh, you know, a supporter of the project, was beaten up. Therefore, the uh, entire, so you know, we went, we went along the entire road project and ensured that the, uh, the excavators were stopped, that the Portland machines were prevented, that the tree cutting, uh, uh, machines and human beings were stopped. So very often they're not. If you, if you don't have the bandwidth to see it through, don't go to court. Don't waste your time and the time of the court if you don't think that you're going to be in some manner responsible to ensuring that the orders of the court are implemented. Next slide, please. So that brings up, I think, uh, what I was told is I did a little intelligence gathering of my own to find out the nature of the audience. My colleague who's in the audience told me that they would, I think what would be preferred is some idea of how to go about PIs, what to avoid, what to steer clear of. I think I've touched some towards the end of my speech, at least that part of it. So I'm open to questions. Thank you, Mr. Mohan. I want to ask only one thing. Uh, you would have noticed that now the uh, Bar of jurisdiction of civil courts is on the rise. Whenever a new act is being enacted, I think it is relegated to a special tribunal. Say we have high courts and supreme court for PILs. Of course, we have got rules and judgments, and we have got civil courts governed by Order 108, Section 91. We are safe. But when you go to tribunals, I find the scope of uh, taking the pro bono publico is not that bright. In such a situation, what could be your advice uh, before the tribunals where the matters can be taken? Is it possible still to go to the tribunals as a pro bono public? No, if you look at the Consumer Protection Act, for example, the yes, Consumer sir. Protection Act has many provisions which make it possible for a consumer organization to go to court. I mean, you saw the Piaggio, when Pal Piaggio went away, you know, taking, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I mean, ah. Uh, so, uh, you know, there were thousands of people who made bookings for scooter and the company wound up. And so people mm -hmm. went and filed these uh, claim petitions on behalf of everyone. If you okay. look at the National Green Tribunal, you, mm -hmm. yes, well, well, you know, I hate tribunals. I think tribunals, you have to start this whole process all over again. You have to start, you know, in the even the specialist tribunals, you have to relearn the jurisprudence. As I told you only last week, the National Green Tribunal in a case concerning uh, the LG polymers spoke about strict liability, which had been jettisoned in terms of absolute liability in 1985. So, strict liability. Yes. So they're still talking about strict liability. Hello. This is 35 years from, from that. So therefore, it's specialist tribunals. Whether we like it or not, are here to stay. I would like to avoid it as much as possible. But until the Supreme Court looks at the entire, and, and you know, the government loves it. You look at the NGT, for example. The NGT was, I mean, you know, there should be justice delivery at doorstep. You were supposed to empower, you, you brought in a law for Gram and Yayalaya. 
you know, which is supposed to have the every taluk level in adjudication. Okay. That law never became, you know, uh, reality. reality. So what do you do next? You centralize. You have at least the high courts hearing the environmental matters, but but they don't like uh, the executive doesn't like the like that. So they want it to move to somewhere. You know how scientists scientists have a box. And, you know everything is in you know, and bureaucrats who are administrative members of the tribunal have been in the system. They, you know, there's a certain amount of understanding how the system works, a certain tolerance of how barbadom really happens. So there's a little more chalta hai attitude. So, you know, judges who go to the tribunal are not necessarily those who have handled environmental matters even. So, you know, you, the, the, what the tribunal, what the executive thinks is wonderful. Let's create such a tribunal. You, you let's have 20 people. Nothing happens. You don't have those 20 people. Then Supreme Court says, no, no, let's set up benches with truncated membership. That is also an order of court. The, this is the Supreme Court which made the NGP operation. Then NG, Supreme Court said all matters pending will be transferred. The Supreme Court said, no, no, new matters will go later. We'll stay our order in so far as the transfers are concerned. But in the meantime, hundreds of cases went. And, you know, they don't have the bandwidth. You have the loss of ecology authority appointed by the Supreme Court in the Bellow Citizens case, which passed orders for thousands, for, you know, in, in the Bellow Citizens case, in the Bellow cluster alone, there were 32,000 people who were victims. And 32 crores of money was, was adjudicated as compensation. In the Noyal matter, in Tirupur, again, about 30, 31,000, 32,000 odd people were identified as polluted people or uh, victims of pollution. Victims of and pollution. 743 industries were identified as polluters. And again, about you know, 30 odd crores was looked at as compensation. But, you know, that's, that's pittance. That gives you a farmer something like 14,000 14, rupees a hectare in, in severe application. That tribunal order itself is so poor. That tribunal order itself, you know, does not do uh, service to any taught principle. But nevertheless, even that order took, you know, its own time getting implemented. You had to go back to the high court. So therefore, at every stage, now they are telling you, if tribal orders don't get implemented, you go to the criminal court and you file a, a private complaint to ensure that the order is implemented. So they made it clunky. They made it difficult, <coughs> And they made it centralized. And even NGT was a southern zone. So instead of having, make it easier, for people to approach the, you know, court or the Munsif court, this is what ideally should have been. But you made, you said everybody in every in the southern state should go to one tribal. So you had four benches, and you you had all the benches becoming becoming uh, dysfunctional because members had retired. And believe the executive wasn't interested in uh, filling up these things because they felt that the NGD was also becoming unpredictable. So you thought you could. I have a case management in, the, in that sense of issue management. Uh, then when the tribunals started developing their own um, hair on their chest or hair on their head, as it were, the, the executive decides one day to make this not work, is not fill it up. But high courts are often told, no, no, you can go to Delhi and file a case. So the man in, or the woman in Kanyakumari has to go to the Supreme Court, or I mean, has to go to the NGT in Delhi. And you know, this are uh, superior courts are saying who refuse to set up benches of the saying, no, no, this will uh, you know, be difficult because if you set up benches, the majesty of the court will be compromised. In COVID times, we are sitting in front of computers and talking to judges, but mm. they are that's not a problem. But having benches of the Supreme Court in various places, you know, would compromise how uh, the, the entire uh, you know, so called. Uh, greatness of the Supreme Court. So that's, so we've had centralized things for two, almost one and a half years. You had no NGT. So you could have gone, yes, most cases that went bear on class action, um, but they did not adjudicate very many tort claims at all. Unlike the loss of ecology authority, you wound up, the executive wound up the loss of ecology authority by going to the high court. And I don't know how the high court, you know, judges, in spite of being told that the NGT will not do this. I, I, you know, it, sometimes adjudication, I wonder how judges who pass orders, you know, how do they live with themselves? You know, you, several years later, you pass an order and the farmer is still nowhere. 
I, I, I would like to get into the heads of those judges and find out, you know, do you review the impact of some order that you passed? You wound up the loss of ecology authority. You said, wonderful, the NGT will set up the third bench in Chennai. Within a month, the second bench, which was there, collapsed. Then the first bench collapsed. You had no benches for the next one and a half years. So should you not have recalled that order and said, you know, I, just clearly, uh, I was we were assured that the third bench of the NGT would be functional. There is no third bench, there is no first bench. These cases have been brought back to the uh, high court. So therefore, there are problems. If you don't want to adjudicate, you push it off to a tribunal. And, you know, and in the, all these one and a half years that the tribunal did not work, you would have thought that the high court would have once again said 226, this way, back, we, we will exercise our power. No, they said, go back to Delhi. You do video conferencing. And that, you know, we now see, I couldn't log on for 20 minutes. <laughs> that's it. That's how difficult it was for me. Uh, I, I dread to think of what the lawyer and college would have to do to log on to the NGD website. I came especially on this. I'm not a webinar person. I came here only because I was told they were younger people and there were people from the trial courts, which I thought was a sector I wanted to read. I was, I was tired of preaching to the converted. Thank you so much. They are the actually target audience for the webinar uh, by yes. us at the moment. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I thank should you. thank you for the for the thank way you. in which you have elucidated and thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you.